Okay, thank you everyone for coming. Um, we're delighted to have Rochelle Davis from Georgetown University, um, whose presentation is fascinating and has a lot of implications, not just for Iraq, but all sorts of displacement that's taking place, um, including in Yemen and Libya, especially now um, mostly uh, Syria and Iraq, but also um, other countries undergoing civil wars or transitions. Um, Rochelle Davis's research is on refugees, war, and conflict, particularly Syrian and Iraqi refugees and internally displaced persons. She's an associate professor of anthropology and the director for the, of the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies. Um, her first book, Palestinian Village Histories, Geographies of the Displaced, was published with Stanford University Press in 2012, addressed how Palestinian refugees today write histories of their villages that were destroyed in the 1948 war and the stories and commemorations of village life that are circulated in the diaspora. She's currently writing a book on the role of, the, of culture in the U.S. military wars in Iraq and Afghanistan based on research she has conducted since 2006. Using interviews with U.S. military service members and Iraqis, policy and strategy documents, cultural training materials, journalists reporting, and soldiers' memoirs, she focuses on the narratives about Iraqis, Afghans, Arabs, and Muslims. Her analysis um, explicates the conundrums of being at, tasked to be culturally sensitive in a military occupation, which is not an easy thing to do, um, and the personnel and collective experiences of war. She's also the principal investigator on the U.S. Department of Educa Education Title VI grant um, in 20, from 2014 and 28 to 2018 for Georgetown's National Resource Center Middle East slash for, for the Middle East slash North Africa. Her talk today is based on her work as a senior researcher on Georgetown's Institute for the Study of International Migration and um, the International Organization for Migration grant, conducting a longitudinal survey of 4,000 Iraqi households displaced since 2014 by ISIS and their access to durable solutions. So there's incredibly rich data um, that we'll, we'll, be, we'll be privy to. So without further ado, Professor Davis. <clears throat> Good afternoon, and uh, thank you. And I think you can all hear me. I'll try not to wander away from the microphone. Um, thank you for coming. So uh, I'm going to show a lot of slides and a lot of data and a lot of pictures, uh, not photographs, but graphs. And I'm, I'm going to talk about this project. I'm the Georgetown side of this project, and I'm the side that has academic freedom and can sort of say and whatever I want. And there's the IOM side of this, uh, of this project. And they're less uh, into the academic freedom part, and because one, they're in Iraq at the invitation of the Iraqi government. But two, they're also funded by all sorts of funders, including the United States government. And so they are very aware of anything that they publish or say comes back uh, to them um, in a negative way, potentially. <coughs> so they, they, they monitor what comes out of them very, very carefully. Uh, so I am representing myself here. I am not representing IOM, and anything that I say is comes from me, not from IOM. I just want to make that clear uh, for them. Uh, so this is a study that IOM approached Georgetown to collaborate on, of looking at all of this data uh, that IOM was collecting. So IOM has pioneered this thing called the displacement tracking matrix. They have it for a number of other countries as well. And you can go to the website and you can explore. And it is a data portal. You can use all the stuff that they produce. And there's graphs and charts and numbers and raw data. And you can do all sorts of things with it if you have those skills. They track Iraqis. In this project, they track Iraqis who are displaced. But they don't track them by name or as an individual body. They just track uh, numbers. So in a village that has a host to 100 displaced Iraqis, they um, count those 100 Iraqis. They come back the next month, and there are 100 Iraqi families there as well, and they count those families. They could be 90 different families. They don't have any way of knowing that sort of stuff. So they're just actually tracking the numbers of displaced, not like individuals. They don't, they're, the individuals don't register. So it's a, it's a different way of kind of tracking people than we're um, usually uh, used to in these sorts of things. They really started in um, March of 2014, uh, and our project is only about displacement uh, due to ISIS, uh, due to Daesh, and what was happening uh, in Iraq and Syria at the time. So there are lots of waves of previous Iraqi displacement, uh, and they don't get caught in any of 
this data or any of what we're talking about. Um, some of these people may be multiply displaced, and that is captured in our study, but I can, I'll talk about that later. Um, so this is the latest that they have produced, and it shows you the governorate of displacement and the governorate of uh, origin. The origin is where people are from, and you can see that there are mostly seven governorates. They're going across the top where people were displaced from, Anbar, uh, Babel, Baghdad, Diyala, uh, a, little, a few from Erbil, and then Kirkuk and Nineveh, and that's where Mos Mosul is, and Salah al-Din. And you can also see that those people went to almost, I think, all of the governorates in Iraq, which are the, the left going down. And you can see the total number of displaced at, in December was 2.6 million. That does not count the people who returned. So there's a whole number of people who have returned who are not captured in this, in this number. Um, <clears throat> this shows you on the right the map where they were displaced from. Darker, the darker it gets, the more people that were displaced. Uh, sorry, this is where they, not where they were displaced from. This is where they arrived. Um, so these are the host areas uh, within Iraq um, <clears throat> where Iraqis ended up. So you can see uh, many of them stayed in and around the borders of the uh, Nineveh uh, governorate and are in Duhuk, which are both in the north. Um, and then others moved into Iraqi Kurdistan, which is in the north east, um, and then all along the, the two rivers of, uh, of the Dijla and the Euphrates, all the way down to Basra, so in the, the entire uh, country. Um, Yes. So we approached this uh, with a couple of, of things in mind. Our research questions were, how do experiences of displacement and access to durable solutions among IDPs in Iraq change over time? And to unpack those words that are in blue, I think is kind of important because IDPs have become a new population of study in the study of displacement and forced migration and refugees. Back when I was doing my PhD uh, dissertation and my comprehensive exams for my PhD, I did a whole section in anthropology on uh, forced migration, and we didn't, I didn't even remember reading about or talking about IDPs. They were just all under the kind of refugee or displaced label. And so, so in the last 20 years, there's really been a a move to think about the difference between IDPs, internally displaced persons. So the official definition is um, persons or groups of persons who have been forced or obliged to flee or to leave their homes or places of habitual residence and who have not crossed an internationally recognized state border. So they all stay within the, within the country of, in theory, that they have citizenship in. Whereas refugees travel outside, I mean, are pushed or flee outside of their country. So, there's been a, this move to really study IDPs and what happens. And, it, and um, UNHCR and other agencies have been talking in the last couple of years about how we are seeing the largest numbers of forced migrants since World War II, where 60 million people are forced migrants. Two thirds of those people are IDPs, and one third of them are refugees. And that's why they call them forced migrants, in order to sort of um, get the umbrella category of both refugees who've crossed borders and internally displaced who have not. The other uh, blue word that we <laughs> should unpack here is durable solutions. Uh, let me see if I have it here. And that is, there have also been uh, discussions uh, among the humanitarian community and others about what are solutions to people who are forcibly displaced. Uh, and they have particularly developed them um, with, uh, with, with everybody who's forcibly displaced, there are three. They are return to their place of origin, integration into their current place of residence, or resettlement elsewhere. Uh, so let me go back. This is what we are trying to look at it, with these IDPs, is what are the durable solutions that they are accessing? Are they looking for return to their homes? Are they trying to integrate where they've found refuge? Or are they going to find another place to live um, in the country or outside of the country? And then the other uh, research question, you can see the needs, coping strategies, and aspirations of the IDPs. 
and what events or factors are perceived to impact these needs, coping strategies over, and aspirations over time. So we really have tried to center this study on the IDPs themselves, rather on the humanitarian aid community or what the government's doing or what uh, international organizations are doing, et cetera. And then finally, we want to try and um, understand the experience of IDPs in Iraq uh, to inform and rethink this idea about what are durable solutions and what are quasi-durable solutions. So, that said, let me go back. We are using the Interagency Standing Committee, that's what IASC stands for, Framework on Durable Solutions. Um, this is all new to me, or it was all new to me two years ago, but now I can, now I can say IASC as if, I, as if I'm really familiar with it. Um, and this is what it's about. Um, it's about kind of really formulating these ideas about durable solutions. We're hoping to kind of also enhance these ideas. This IASC framework has eight criteria that they put under the idea of durable solutions. And they are long-term safety and security, family reunification, access to livelihoods and employment, access to effective remedies and justice, access to personal and other documentation without discrimination, enjoyment of an adequate standard of living without discrimination, participation in public affairs without discrimination, and effective and accessible mechanisms to restore housing, land, and property. A lot of this is tied to the without discrimination. So if everybody uh, does not have long-term safety and security, um, that's not as much of a problem. If it's only the IDPs that don't have uh, long-term safety and security, then that would be considered that they do not, you know, they've not been able to access this durable solution. So it's really a lot of it is about this kind of without discrimination, so that they are fitting into where they are. Okay, let me talk a little bit about methodology. Um, before I do that, the one last thing. This durable solutions framework is really about a rights-based approach that it's, that it's um, embedded in this is, are a lot of the United Nations and, and um, state governments' ideas about rights and what you have rights to as a citizen of a state. And so we, this way of looking at uh, IDPs also sort of keeps them within that rights-based approach um, so that it also makes governments responsible to the IDPs because they are still citizens of that state. Okay, the methodology. Um, I'm an anthropologist. <laughs> I don't, I'm going to read these words out here, but this is not my area <laughs> of expertise. You can ask me questions about it, but I may say I don't know because I don't really know um, the margin of error, et cetera, or how it was calculated. Uh, so we used a mixed methods, uh, longitudinal or a panel design, um, and we're, we're, using, we're doing four rounds over two years. Uh, we did the first uh, interviews in uh, the first uh, questionnaires in March and April of 2016, then February and March of 2017, and then the third one was in July and August of 2017. Our target was 4,000 households, which is a huge number of people, um, in four different governorates. And we did them in um, Baghdad, uh, Basra, Kirkuk, and Suleimaniyah. Suleimaniyah is in the Kurdistan region of Iraq in the north. Kirkuk is kind of in the middle. Uh, Baghdad is the capital, obviously, and the smallest geographical uh, uh, governorate. And then Basra is in the south um, on the, on the um, Persian uh, Gulf. And they had, they're really different. And part of the reason we chose those four is because, one, some of them are less studied than the others. Duhuk and, and Nineveh and the areas in the north have a lot more of the international community there and a lot more sort of uh, um, just a lot more studies are done of those areas because there's also a, uh, many more IDPs were around those areas because they stayed closer to home. Um, we also did it because we had to have um, the, all of these surveys were done by IOM employees who were all Iraqis themselves. And it was very uh, important that they also, their physical safety and security be um, taken into consideration. And so some of these areas were just a little too hot to send a whole bunch of people into to um, sit in people's homes and drink tea and ask them questions. Um, this is 
As far as we know, one of the only, if not the only, longitudinal study of displaced people, of internally displaced people. And one of the reasons it can be done is because the way IOM has been set up in Iraq and this whole di displacement tra uh, tracking matrix that I, I talked about at first, and because there is this huge presence of IOM there and the cooperation of the Iraqi government, which helps everyone move around. People who are forced migrants are very difficult to track. I mean, they're very difficult to sort of follow because they are, uh, are you know, they're displaced and so they are often, often moving a lot. Um, it is absolutely amazing, everyone tells me, that we have a retention rate of 96.05%. Over the two years that we have done this, we've lost 3% of the 4,000 household sample or the 3,852 sample. I mean, that, people tell me, is really quite amazing. So um, it, it really is kudos to our 30 Iraqi enumerators who just keep following people. And I'll talk a little bit about how they do that in a, in a, in a moment. We use a tracking system called Textit. It's a common uh, text-based system. And we send a text to the families, uh, the 3,854 families. We send a text to them every month. And they respond. And the text says, are you still living where you were last month? And they say yes, or they say no. And if they say no, then we call them and find out where, where they're living now. Um, and if they say yes, then they, then, and it's all done automatically, except for the phone call. We also pay them. Eight, uh, uh, 10,000 Iraqi dinars a month, which is about $8, which covers their phone usage probably for the month. So it's not a huge amount, but it's not nothing. I mean, it's not two cappuccinos, which it would be here. It's, it's actually, you know, it's your phone bill, essentially, <coughs> the equivalent of here. To me, this is one of the most important things that we do, is that we are compensating people for their time and energy and effort and willingness to participate with us. It is the largest portion of the budget by far is the compensation for the families. And um, I'd make it more if I could, but I'm not that high up on the food chain. Um, what I am responsible for are the qualitative interviews. Um, and so we do every round there when the, the quantitative interviews happen, we also do qualitative interviews. And so I went to Iraq in uh, early 2016 and worked with the 30 Iraqi numerators to develop the qualitative questionnaires. Um, and I prepared everything to do this training on qualitative, how you do qualitative uh, questionnaires, confidentiality, all those, internet, uh, all those uh, institutional review board, human subjects protection things that you're supposed to do. I prepared it all in Arabic, and I have it all, and I'm standing up in front of everybody. And I've never been to Iraq before. This is the first time I've ever been there. We're, we're in Erbil in a very fancy hotel room. Um, in a hotel conference space, and there's these 30 Iraqis in front of me, and I, I start in Arabic, and I'm like, start this whole training, and I'm going on, and then this group of people on this side kind of raises their hand, and they're like, can you also do it in English, because we don't really understand Arabic. <laughs> because the whole team from Iraqi Kurdistan are Kurdish speakers, and they may know a little bit of Arabic, but they weren't trained in Arabic. They, so I'm like, they end up doing this training bilingually. Um, and it was, it was a really uh, interesting experience for all of us to kind of come together and do this. And so I actually turned it over to them and I had them uh, come up with the questions. I said, okay, these are, you know, this is what we're looking at. These are the durable solutions. What kind of questions should be, we be asking? You are the ones that know more about these subjects than, than, um, than us. What would be interesting? They came up with some really interesting questions. We couldn't use them all because some of them were a little too interesting, um, but but we really kind of um, got we, it, it was it was great, and I think they really also felt part of the process, and which was important because they were the ones going to have to answer the questions. Um, we then got on a bus like three days later to go to a place to sort of practice asking questions, and they immediately put on a song that I'd never heard before, which was like. Um, the, the talking about all of the different uh, governorates of Iraq and what the different um, characteristics of those people were. And so we're driving on a bus through Erbil and everybody's singing and clapping to, you know, the, fa the Basra people, they make the best coffee. And then, you know, the people of Kirkuk, they're this, that, and the other thing. So we're, we're like, you know, steaming down the highway with a bunch of people. That was, our, that was our group of enumerators who were really sort of coming together and they came from all different parts of Iraq to sort of, it, it was a very interesting 
way to kind of come together and think about them. They were thinking of themselves as Iraqis and as together in this process and of sort of trying to smooth over any differences that they may have internally because we had about half men, half women. I have no idea people's religious. Um, I mean, I know there are Shia, I know there were Sunnis, I know there were Christians among them. There were Kurdish, Turkmen, um, Arab, among all of the uh, of, among all of our enumerators as well, and so they really mirrored themselves the kind of population of Iraq. Okay, here's our sample in round one and round two. Um, this is published, uh, and if you Google "durable solutions longitudinal study Iraq," you'll find your way to the to the 80-page uh, report of round one that we did. These were the displacement flows so that you can see these were the four governorates in dark that we, where we did the interviews. Um, and this is where they came from, yeah, all of these different uh, places. These are the locations of it, for the first round where we did the quantitative in blue and the qualitative in red. So you can see they were pretty well spread out around the, uh, around the governorates. Okay, some information about uh, the, the sample. You can see the timeline of displacement here, majority of people sort of in 2014, uh, and then drops off pretty uh, specifically, uh, pretty quickly. We also thought it would be really interesting to know when they thought they fled, right? Did they flee before ISIS came, which we had been hearing from a lot of the Christian villages in the north in, in, um, in Nineveh that they had heard, you know, they would hear that something um, was happening somewhere and they would sort of pick up and flee because of, they had heard stories from another nearby village of what had happened there. So, um, and, and uh, so they categorized themselves, but that was really in our, in our entire um, sample, that was really just 11.5% who fled before. The, the majority fled uh, during, um, so while ISIS was, you know, knocking on the door sort of thing. And then 34% uh, fled after ISIS had taken over whatever area they were in. So in the qualitative, we ask, we ask them to tell that story of how they fled and why they fled. And so we have a lot of, um, a lot of explanatory material that really details what happened and the circumstances behind which they fled. The sample also, um, I'll show you here, is reasonably representative of what we would expect in Iraq with two, well, in particular this area right here, I think you can see the mouse. That's the demographic of uh, 55 to 59 and then also a little bit, ooh, mouse left uh, here, among men. We know this in other demographic surveys of Iraq that because of the Iran-Iraq war, there is a dearth of men who were killed during that period and they really show up in this sample even among these IDPs uh, as well. The other thing that is, was surprising to the people that study this is how few children there are between the ages of zero and four. It should, I've been told, be similar to uh, between the ages of five and nine and it's not. So, this whole displacement has really dropped um, women's um, or families' uh, childbearing. Uh. So we're going to, um, I'm going to go through now the eight durable solutions uh, that we uh, came up with. And we, uh, using the eight durable solutions, the sort of conclusions that we came out of from the report. Uh, Long-term safety and security. So. If we start oh, up on the left, I have what the actual uh, ISC framework says, and so I've just put that text there for every single one of these. Um, what we see was there, what they report of before they fled, before January 1st, 2014 was the date we, we uh, had them target. There was a pretty strong sense of not feeling terribly safe. So the blue is either n not safe, moderately unsafe, or totally unsafe, or sorry, neither safe nor unsafe, moderately unsafe, or totally unsafe. Um, and you can see 30% of people fell into that category with sort of a little more than 30% feeling complete, completely safe and a little more than 30% feeling moderately safe. In 2000, 
2016 and 2017, the number who feel unsafe drops dramatically. So what, what we sort of, it's very obvious actually, that displacement is a way that makes people feel much safer. They find ways to feel safe in displacement, even if that means they have to move multiple times, which many people did. Um, the other interesting thing is that with the passage of time, they actually feel um, more safe. And I think our third round, it actually drops, drops a little bit, but I, I don't have the magic, um, magic graph person to incorporate the third round yet, yet in. Um, the other thing that's happening is with the passage of time, they feel more accepted by the host community. And so, again, not surprising, um, feelings of acceptance are also uh, tied to feelings of uh, safety and security. And so we see this, this to us says that, well, maybe integration, and, and integration is going to be one of the um, solutions that people find more popular and, and, and actually start to work for because they are feeling more safe and they are feeling more accepted where they are three years after displacement. Um, you see what, what are the sources of insecurity uh, as they self-report. So in January 2014, you can see there's either no insecurity or kidnapping, targeted violence, generalized violence, fl fighting, which is the largest, discrimination and petty crime and theft. And then in 2016, in round one, there's some other, which um, is, is unknown at, uh, at this point, but the biggest source of, of insecurity is petty crime and theft. So really they feel like this whole issue of generalized uh, violence and fighting and targeted violence is, is much, much uh, lower. So the second one is standard of living. Um, we asked people about their ability to provide for their basic needs. Uh, before displacement, it was, uh, sorry, give me the exact statistic, it was 92.6%, uh, oh, sorry, it wasn't that one, it was, uh, oh, I don't know, it was close to 96, 97% said that they could provide for their ba for family's basic needs before being displaced. After displacement, it, of course, went way down, and it probably was much lower in, in other times, but it, it, it got better as time went, went along. Um, and one of the uh, things that we have found uh, really affects this standard of living is that, um, make sure, so close to 80% or a little over 80% of families owned their own houses before, di before they were displaced. And so when they are displaced, they suddenly have to find another place to live, and that other place to live can, is either, um, as you can see, they, um, they, <clears throat> they're hosted by friends and relatives or the host community, or they have to rent, an, uh, rent accommodations, either for just their own family or for other, f that, that's a shared accommodation. So suddenly, if they were making, you know, um, if they were making um, $800 a month, when, and they owned their own home, they paid for, you know, uh, food, clothes, you know, cooking gas, uh, heat, heating oil, those sorts of things. They're displaced, and they, maybe they still have $800 a month, but two or $300 of it is going to go to rent or what, whatever it is. So they suddenly have a new expense in displacement. Almost everybody does. I think only 4% live in a place, live in a, in a property that they own. So that is a huge um, factor on changing um, standard of living. And you can see uh, how one of the day laborers uh, explains this. This is one of my favorite stories because it, it's, it's like, it's a, just a good story. A month ago, one of my friends in the army found me a bigger house, which was new and had the same rental cost. I decided to move there after reaching an agreement with the owner. I told my wife about it, and the next day I received a call from the owner of the home, and he told me that he had refused to rent me the home. When I found him and asked him, he said that some people had come to him and forbade him from renting to me. When I returned, I saw the neighbors at my house, and when they saw me, they said, do you want to leave us? And they laughed. When I asked them, they said, we learned from your wife that you want to rent outside of this area. So we went to the owner of the house, and we wouldn't al allow him to do it. We're going to fix up the house at our own expense, and if you want to leave the area, it will only be to return to your original area. 
This was a positive event and it affected me deeply because of their affection and their compassion for me. And so there's these kind of deep ties that get, that get made as, as the, the, the displaced people are themselves trying to figure out where they want to go and how they want to live. They're also, it's not just about them, right, essentially is what this, this story is, is, is saying. Um, and there's, there's a lot of stories of this kind of hospitality of the host community and people living and um, either not paying rent or paying partial rents or things like this. And there are also stories of people sort of being targets of suspicion um, or discrimination, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Livelihood. Um, we, these are uh, interesting statistics here. You can see uh, paid public job, paid private job, agriculture farming on own land, agriculture farming on others' lands, business, informal commerce, day labor, pension. Uh, I think that's no source of revenue. I can't actually tell. We're going to skip over 2016. I'll talk about that in a second. And then we go to 2017. And you can see uh, paid job public remains almost the same. This was a policy of the Iraqi government that even when they were in displacement, they still received their government, their salary for their government job. And if the Iraqi government could, it found them the job in the new place where they were displaced. So if they were a school teacher, they often just got put into a different school. You know, if they were from a school teacher from Kirkuk and they ended up in um, Baghdad, they got put into a, a, a job, a school in, in Baghdad. If they couldn't find a job, many of them still got their salaries. <clears throat> which I think was a, a really smart policy by the government to kind of keep people alive is essentially what it did. Um, the other thing that stayed similar was the pension, because of course people still received their pension. It might have been late, but you know, they, or they had to kind of transfer it, but that, that still kept people alive. Um, what you also see here is the agricultural farm uh, on own land. That was sort of 21% of people, their primary sources of income were related to farming, that drops to one less than one percent in in displacement, and and so you have this this huge this population that was used to income from from agricultural either their own labor or otherwise, that suddenly that is just wiped out, um, and we see by far that displacement is an urban phenomenon much more than so I think it's about sixty five percent of Iraqis live in uh, cities, and some, something over 90% of displaced Iraqis are in urban areas. And so displacement, um, most, many of the Iraqis um, who fled, fled to urban areas because there were services there, because there was housing, because they had family members that they could stay with for all variety of different reasons. And I think this ties to, um, I think this is an important point where policies could be made differently in which uh, we don't put all the services in an urban area, so we don't cause uh, urbanization. And there are interesting stories coming out of the, some of the communities who were living in the distant areas of Mosul, and they were, um, you know, in small towns, um, and they, their family is displaced, and they end up in a big town like Erbil, um, and now the parents want to go back to the small town because they had a house and they had agricultural land and they, you know, had sheep and, and, and the kids are like, no way. <laughs> I'm not going back to that little tiny town where there was nothing to do. I'm staying in the big city because it's interesting and I'm meeting new people and I can go to university and, or I have a job and I didn't, wasn't going to have a job there. So it, this kind of displacement is also sort of going to, it's going to kind of upset the, or change the social fabric, et cetera, and, and the kind of living patterns of people, which we always see in displacement. But um, so here's a quote from a from a woman. Um, you can read it. I will um, make sure I've said everything I'm supposed to say. So the fourth uh, durable solution is effective and accessible mechanisms to restore housing, land, and property. And 
So we've asked a lot of different questions that try and get at this. One of that, which is IDP's perception of most important factors for return to prior place of residence by their current govern governor where they're living now. And interestingly, the largest one is a uh, good security situation in general. Um, and, and then second was money, financial resources, a job, and then the third was a house, a place to return to. Um, it, it, um, it shouldn't be surprising that people don't want to return if the situation isn't secure and safe because, because of how, how much, how they have reported, how they feel safe and secure where they are now that they want, to, they want that sense of safety and security when they return. And very few are willing to do, to, to make that sort of jump to um, someplace less uh, safe. We've been trying to follow the compensation um, mechanisms that have been put in place by the Iraqi government. So they started in 2015 creating an additional compensation mechanism for just uh, this ISIS-based displacement. Uh, they have a, the Ministry of, of Displacement and Migration uh, has a whole compensation uh, mechanism in place from 2003 onward, and they've, they've uh, um, distributed a compensation for many people displaced. This post, this one post um, displaced by ISIS has, um, has been in place and it's being rolled out by governorate. IOM doesn't follow this at all. Uh, and so I have um, a couple of research assistants that, are go th that go through all of the Iraqi government uh, documents on this and what, what, what's happening. And we've been meeting with various Iraqis and Iraqi um, embassy officials to try and really make sure that we're being accurate uh, on how we're, gonna, how we're reporting this. It's, it's, it's got a name so long that um, I can't, it, like it wouldn't even fit on a power, PowerPoint slide, but we call it, but it's called, the short version is the Compensation Committee, uh, no, the Central Committee for the Compensation of Those Afflicted, and then it continues, afflicted by terrorism and, the dis, and have disabilities and have lost their property, and it goes on. It's a really long name. They have a whole s system set in place, but people have to actually go back and register in their governorate of displacement. So if you're living in Basra and you are displaced from Nineveh, which is in the far north, and Basra is in the far south, you can't register in Basra for, your, for compensation to your property. You actually have to go back to uh, Nineveh governorate and register there. And you register with a team and then they take you, then you try and go see the house and you have to submit photographs of the house and you have to submit your property ownership documents, et cetera. So it's happening. It's happening very slowly, but it's happening, uh, which is a good, good thing. Um, I think one of the most important things that we are finding is um, <clears throat> that, that the returns are really driven by the IDPs themselves. They are the ones that are saying, I must return. And these two quotes kind of show you both some of what the difficult situations are when they, when they do return. They may not have um, access to cash to, to renovate their house because they may have registered, but they may not have actually yet seen the compensation back. And so they, they'll, they'll start and they'll do one or two rooms and they'll live in those one or two rooms and then they'll sort of gather enough money to, um, to do the rest of it. Um, there's also, in these uh, situations, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in the return, um, th there, there, aren't, there isn't a lot of infrastructure there. So even getting the materials to rebuild have to kind of be part of, of there have to be merchants who come back who can, can sell cement and who can truck it in and those sorts of things. There needs to be hospitals. There needs to be electricity. There needs to be water. All, a lot of this stuff was wiped out. Um, Um, we've crammed together access to personal and other documentation and family reunification, reunification together because neither of them were big issues. Um, most people di didn't lose documents and if they did, they've had not a lot of problems replacing them. The problems they've had with replacing them are the cost of doing it. 
The documents themselves don't cost a lot, but they again have to go back to their governorate of origin and they have to submit the forms and they have to wait. And so they either have to pay for transportation or they lose the money if they were back working somewhere, they lose those, those, that time um, when, they were, when they would have been working. So they're, they, uh, that's what they can't sort of afford. Um, but the Iraqi government has been very good about making sure that people could get uh, replacement documents. There's been a real problem because ISIS, um, particularly when they, kidna when they kidnapped people or they detained people, they often took their documents. These are what the stories that we have from um, people are coming out. So this one man says, yeah, you know, somebody grabbed me and my, my, my documents were in my coat and they were trying to detain me and I slipped out of my coat and jumped in the river and swam across and got away from them, but my documents were in my coat. So what the Iraqi government, I think, has thought is, you know, now you have a bunch of people who are potentially um, ISIS or ISIS supporters with access to people's documents who are not them, but who are clean, I mean, who are not ISIS supporters' documents. And so the Iraqi government takes a long time in going through and canceling the old documents and making sure that people don't have police records. And I mean, so it's a real sort of security um, a security risk that the Iraqis are taking on, um, or, or they're they're trying to sort of um, vet people so that they they're they're not um, allowing former ISIS members or supporters to sort of slip into among the among the regular population, and this is a huge problem that we don't totally get in in our study in the quant part of the study. We get it a lot more in the qualitative part of the study because we did interviews with 80 host community members in all of our, um, in, in each round of the interview, uh, 20 in each governorate, and we did about 10, so if there are 20 in a governorate, we did 10 neighbors of IDPs, and then 10 people who were either healthcare professionals, education, uh, local governor, governors, religious clergy, uh, drivers, uh, and other kinds of, of sort of local um, professions. And there's a huge fear of the IDPs that they are bringing ISIS with them, sort of a thing. So families that fled from areas that were ISIS, where ISIS had taken over, that someone in that family may have been an ISIS affiliate and somebody grabs them. You know, the family just pulls them out to get away from that. And they're, they're, so the host community really expresses this kind of fear that these IDPs, yeah, they're okay, they haven't done anything, but we don't really know if they're sort of just sleeping ISIS cells. Um, and so that, I think, is a place where the Iraqi government and others can really kind of work to think about um, how um, people fleeing, you know, how, how, the, how the, those narratives about them and who they are can be reconstructed to think about them as victims and not as also potential perpetrators. And also to have policies where they vet people so that if there are ISIS sympathizers among them that they sort of get, um, that they, that that gets addressed. I mean, we're certainly very familiar with this in Trump's America, so. Um, the other part of the IDP, um, the access to durable solutions is participation in public affairs. And we've really struggled with this. Um, to try and find ways, let me go to, uh, to try and find ways to capture this because there are very low levels of participation in public affairs in Iraq in general, um, but particularly among IDPs. And so we asked this question about, do you feel that you and your family have, um, sorry, typo, have the power to make important decisions that can change the course of your life? And while there are most people were felt that they were more able rather than less, um, you, you see a kind of a neutral, that they are, they are neutral. Um, when I put my anthropological um, cloak on and I think about this question, I think, oh my God, what is some Iraqi family doing? And we're, you know, we ask them this question, like, do you feel that you, can, you have the power to make important decisions that can change the course of your life? I think, how are they gonna answer this question? I mean, they've just been forcibly displaced. They like, you know, may or may not have enough money to, to, you know, to make it. They've borrowed money from families to, to survive. They have to go get aid, you know, they wait. And then we're asking them if they have the power to make important decisions. It's such a, like a, like I feel like a Deepak Chopra question or whatever the man's name is. I mean, it's such a kind of, like, do you have power sort of thing. 
the answer. Um, I, what we can do with these answers, I totally don't know. I think the neutral is really indicative of their kind of like, yeah, I have to give you an answer, but I don't really know what to say. So um, we have really interesting discussions, as you can imagine, between our Iraqi enumerators, the quant people, and the qualitative people. We, we, we talk about these questions a lot as we try to figure out the answers. This is a really big chart. Um, <laughs> We ask this question, to what extent do differences such as the following tend to cause problems in the place where you were or are living? Um, I'm going to break this down, but these were the, these were the differences that, that uh, we came up with. Ethnic linguistic background, religious beliefs, political party affiliations, differences between host community and IDPs, younger and older generations, men and women, social status, land holdings, wealth, material possessions, and education. This is a smaller snapshot of it. <coughs> I thought it was really, so in the US, we live with this way of talking about Iraqis as if they are sort of constantly uh, in, enmeshed in this sectarian struggle that goes back to, I don't know, the time of Abraham or something. I mean, the way we frame, um, particularly the American way of framing our discussions around Iraq are tied to the American invasion of Iraq and the failure to make Iraq a functioning country again. And, and, and we, we frame that in a very sectarian narrative and we blame it on the Iraqis, that the Iraqis themselves are flawed, that they are sectarian, that they can't get along, these sorts of things. Instead of taking responsibility for destroying the state of Iraq and disbanding the police and the, and the military and, you know, banning and, um, firing everyone who was in the Ba'ath Party. So we, we don't ever actually address the way the invasion and occupation took place and how it undermined the country, and instead we blame Iraqi sort of sectarianism. This question, interestingly, sort of has Iraqis answering this with, and you can see the different, um, the different answers. The place where they put the differences that cause problems, the largest um, of a lot, in both cases are on political parties rather than religious beliefs or ethnic linguistic background. So it, 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 it's, in some ways it's sort of Iraqis framing this in, in a much more political sense than they are framing it in a kind of in, you know, indigenous who we are sense. I mean, that's certain, that indigenous who we are is certainly part of it, you know, that it is, there are ethnic linguistic background differences, there are religious belief differences and those cause problems. But that more of them call, um, tied it to political party affiliations, I think, is a meaningful um, thing to talk about. Now, of course, political party affiliations are also tied to ethnic linguistic background and religious beliefs. They're not absent. I mean, that, those things aren't separated. But that they would articulate it in that way is also important, that they, that they didn't just bleed them into the same thing. So we're working on this one um, as well. And part of this ties to access to effective remedies and justice, um, in that justice is a key condition for all of these things. The largest one that they thought they, that justice was a key condition to was for security. And that as in, the, in their seeking justice, um, they were um, much more interested in seeking justice as an individual or family, as a member of local community, than as a member of an ethnic or a religious group. And, um, I'm almost done. Um, we, um, we also asked, and this is from round three, how much do you trust particular institutions? And as you can see, um, <coughs> courts of law were in the somewhere between, everybody got a lot of just a little, um, but of the one who got the most completely was courts of law. So Iraqis are really saying that we are interested in the kind of um, the structural state mechanisms that can protect us, right, that can get us justice, rather than tribal leaders um, who got pretty high on the not, not at all and just a little, and religious cler clergy who got really high on not at all, which is, I think, also an interesting finding um, and got, you know, pretty low on the completely. Returnees. One of the really cool things that we're doing now is we're following people as they return, and we're both quantitative and qualitative, um, qualitatively. Um, 
the qualitative is a little bit hard to do. I mean, both of them are hard to do. The, the enumerators um, who were responsible for Baghdad, they had to go into Anbar, which is a pretty uh, rough neighborhood. Um, they now know what uh, they said they got so used to seeing it all, they can tell whether a building was blown up from the inside, which means it was ISIS that took it down, or whether it um, was bombed from the air um, by the way that the building had been destroyed. They could, they could tell you which, who had destroyed a building, by the way, whether it had been blown up from the inside or bombed from the top. They have a whole new level of knowledge that they didn't have when they finished their you know, geology degree or their sociology degree, which is what a lot of our um, enumerators um, graduated with. They also had to do a lot of the interviews in um, tribal leaders' homes or areas in, they also had to do them in, um, police stations because they went to the police station to just check in and say we're here they go in an IOM car and everything and they said okay we're gonna go to this place because we gotta go follow that family and the police said you're on your own we are not following you if anything happens don't call us and so they were like hmm maybe we shouldn't <laughs> go out there so I'll, the families would then come to these areas and and do the interviews um, there's, there's a lot to be said there, but, um, but the important thing is we're, we're keeping contact and sort of in the future we're hopefully going to be able to go back to interviewing them in their homes. Um, you, this map over on the right is where people have returned to. Um, and this father says, you know, in general the neighborhood appeared to be abandoned and destroyed, including major services like schools, institutions, hospitals, and buildings. In particular, I found that most of my house was damaged and that I'd lost all of my belongings, like the car and furniture. That was a reason for profound sadness for what I had lost and what I saw in a view of ruins and destruction. Um, and, and this picture, I think, really kind of illustrates how people are taking their homes, which were once lovely and, and, um, and, you know, and are now destroyed, and then trying to kind of recreate um, their lives um, there. These are some of the main conclusions from our findings. Um, See. So the importance of housing for the displaced and returnee, returned IDPs is clear. They want housing. I mean, they express housing as a priority, particularly after security. Um, in, in 2017, 60% of IDPs and 58% of IDPs who had moved, um, they still mentioned housing as among the top requirements for return. And nearly half of them indicated if they had received a large sum of money, they would spend it on shelter and housing. That was kind of really what they what they wanted. Um, we think it's also really important um, to mark how much this return movement is driven by the IDPs themselves, and that that. Because they are driving the return, they also need to be given the economic um, and structural ways to continue that return, either through loan programs, um, through work programs where they can, they can be paid to be, rebuild their homes and rebuild build businesses and things like that. And some of that is happening, um, not, 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 not at the same pace that people are returning, though, if 3.5 million people have returned. So there's a lot of kind of policy implications of the various things that we are finding. Um, you can see some of them. One of, the, um, one of the things we were surprised to find was how important borrowing was, that um, I think it's over 45% of people borrowed from family members in order to um, get through the, get through the, the the time um, where they, to get through uh, their experience in, in displacement. And one man says, you know, he says, yeah, I've returned, but, and, and I'm kind of surviving, but I can't pay the people that I, I can't repay my debts. I can't repay the people that I borrowed from because I'm not, I don't have enough money to both live and repay people. And I think this idea of borrowing, because, because, 95% of people borrowed from family or friends. So they're borrowing from known people. Um, and it, it, 
it keeps the burden of displacement on the very people and their and their networks who were subject to displacement. It, it doesn't. It's not like there are banks or you know charities or government institutions that are giving people uh, loans. Instead, it stays in the family, which is has an accountability mechanism and and you know and it ties people families uh, together. But it also the it, it doesn't shift the burden away from the family. So the family even in displacement is still trying to kind of hold itself together in various ways. Lots of people eat up their savings. Um, lots of people sold assets. Women sold gold. Uh, families sold cars. I mean, it, it's people really kind of went down to, to, to zero in order to survive. So that when they return, their assets are mostly depleted. And any assets that they have are back in their in their homes that were largely destroyed. And so they, they awful, often talk about, like, you know, I spent 20 years building this house, and I got married here, and, you know, my wife and I, um, we built, you know, we, we furnished it, and we did all of these things, and now we come back, and it's just all, it's just all gone. It's been destroyed. It's been looted. It's been these kinds of things. So in the qualitative interviews, we get a lot of the emotions of what that means uh, to people. I have a... I, I used this project. I used um, 380 of or more of the of the qualitative interviews. I taught a course last semester for uh, graduate students on um, contemporary Arab society. And the last six weeks, we worked on Iraq. And their final paper had to be to work with this qualitative material. So I gave them access to our software, our coding software program. We use Deduce because it's online. Um, and so I have 13 papers written by students on um, on, using this data. One of them is, a, is on compensation. One of them is another student is looking at female heads of households and what um, and how female heads of households have been targeted by the aid community or not and how they are their economic um, just all the ways that they are, are surviving in all of this and as part of the class we watched a few of the Syrian puppet shows. I don't know if you've ever seen Maslas uh, et which is a fantastic Syrian, um, it's like a, it's, it uses little finger puppets and it kind of makes fun of the Syrian regime all the time. If you ever want to look it up, Masaset Matti is the, what's, what is it, Matte, um, that drink in Argentino, Matta? Mate, yeah, thank, thank you. So it's like, it's called a mate straw, but it's in Arabic. They're fantastic. And so she now wants the student who did the, um, who did the female heads of household, she's now, had a friend make little um, puppets, and she's going to do a whole puppet show with um, with uh, Saadia and Abdullah, and Saadia is the female head of household, and Abdullah is her dead husband, and there's going to be a whole kind of little puppet show using the narratives that these women um, have created to kind of talk back to Iraqis about what the issues are that female heads of households are, are facing because she's seeing there's you know some sort of social discrimination towards them and so she wants to address this back she herself is Syrian um, I've had and so the students did all these really interesting projects using this material so you really see one did um, the idea of home and returning to home and what that means to people pulling out on both the quant data and all of the qualitative data and I think that's it thank you Your comment was that you, if I understood you correctly, that you're surprised that <clears throat> they're drawing more on politics than these ethnic divisions. Um, and so I would like to push you or hear your response. When I <clears throat> read that, my assumption was that people were moving simply to ethnic enclaves because we understand that that's how people migrate. You migrate, if you're from Mexico, you migrate um, to, mm -hmm. let's say, the south side of Chicago. Um, oh, great. Um, and you live in an enclave with other Mexicans in this example. So yeah. <coughs> um, you keep these cultural uh, similarities. And I was wondering if that's what the results that you see there. So you wouldn't experience differences with your neighbors based on ethnic um, dissimilarities if your neighbors are the same ethnicity, for instance. 
Um, and then the question that I had for you is a much broader one. I was hoping you could just talk a little bit more about the survey instrument that you use and how you blended qualitative and quantitative um, questions, if it's more like an ethno survey or, or what it looked like and maybe some hurdles or some, uh, some things that went well. Uh, I'd just like to hear more about the instrument itself. Sure. Uh, about your first question, I think, I think the answer is yes and no. I think there are people who went to ethno-linguistic religious enclaves because they may have been there, they may have been there from there originally. We see like 26% of the, of the um, sample from, that ended up in Basra was originally from Basra. And they had moved north to Nineveh to work, or Kirkuk, to work for the gas and oil companies that are there. And they'd done that 30 years ago. And they, um, so when they got displaced, they went back to Basra because they had family there and it made sense. Um, you also see the Turkmen, who are from uh, that, from, uh, from Kirkuk and um, uh, Ninua area. The Turkmen who are Shia, for some reason that nobody seems to be able to tell me, a lot of them end up in Basra as well. Is it because they're Shia? Is it because somebody knew somebody that said, oh, come here? And, the, and um, Basra has very few international uh, NGOs doing aid work. And instead, the Basra kind of NGO, charitable community, mosques, et cetera, has really kind of rallied around um, helping people. There's many fewer um, displaced people in Basra. But so you have all these Turkmen who speak Turkmani, I mean, who speak Turkish. I mean, they also probably speak Kurdish and Arabic as well, ending up in Basra. And they, they do happen to be Shia, but, but everybody talks about them like that they're Turkmen, not that they're Shia. So there's this, the, I, you know, so it's, with 4,000 people and try, trying to figure out where they go and what the population of is of that particular group, group where they've gone is also hard, but we will eventually get there. So I think yes, it does, but I think no, it doesn't. And like if you, all these people move to Sulaymaniyya, I, I inadvertently cut out the slide, but like 96% of the people that are in our survey, the, the, the sample, are Arab. They are not Kurdish. And yet the, a huge number of them end up in Sulaymaniyya. So there are Arabs who end up in Sulaymaniyya, which is part of the Kurdistan uh, Republic, Kurdistan region, sorry. Um, they don't speak Kurdish, and yet they don't report any problems for the most part. They have the highest levels of getting along with their neighbors, of feeling accepted, and they're clearly not going there for ethnic, li linguistic, are they going there for religious reasons? Because that part of, I, I mean, Kurds are both Sunni and Shia, so, I, you know, it's really hard to map this on. And on that point, we did not, we collected people's self-reported religious, so they self-reported, and I was reading through the questionnaire the day before it was going uh, out to, for translation. And I, I read how other groups had been allowing people to self-report. And I think it was, no, it, was, it might have been, I can't remember who it was, a big polling organization. Um, I have real problems with making Iraqis check a box that says Sunni Muslim, Shia Muslim, um, Christian, a variety of Christians, um, Yazidi, I don't know how to say it in English, Sabayan, sab sab sabai, sabai um, there's a number of other smaller ones. How do, how, because we don't do that to ourselves, I mean we do in, a, in some ways, but we, we now in our census you have a box you can check mixed, right? So, and I thought we are potentially just feeding into this idea that they have to be one of these things. So I sort of insisted that we add a box that said Muslim. So that they could choose to be Muslim if they wanted to, or they could choose to be Sunni Muslim, or they could choose to be Shia Muslim, which totally messes with how we talk about them. 
which means we cannot talk about how many Sunni Muslims left, which I kind of love. On, I, the anthropologist in me kind of loves. The quantitative people um, on, our, on our work hate me for it. But I just, I think it's wrong to make people choose what, I mean, what do you do if you have, they also could be mixed. So Muslim, Sunni Muslim, Shia Muslim, or mixed, I think. I don't think we called it sushi, but that is one of my favorites, like Sunni, Shia, sushi um, choices. So we actually can't track that data, to, to, is the other thing. Because, because what if somebody just identifies as Muslim? What if they are choosing to not have a sectarian identification? And we, we would allow ourselves to do that, so we should also allow Iraqis to do those sorts of things. The survey instrument. Um, the quantitative was done first in the round one to find everybody. The qualitative was then done subsequently in some cases, unless they were really far away. And then they may have done them in the same day. Because like in Basra, sometimes they had to travel for four hours to get to one of the places. And so they weren't going to go back and forth multiple times. Round two, the qualitative was done first. So round one, the qualitative was one group of people. Round two, qualitative was a different group of people. Round three, qualitative was following the same ones from round two. I've never done a qualitative longitudinal study before. So, and we are just finishing coding and translating all of the round three. So it's going to be really interesting to follow kind of how they reported in round two and how they reported in round three. Um, and then the host communities were done at the same time that the, the qualitative IDP were done at the same time the qualitative host communities were done. The returnee interviews, um, quant and qual were done at the same time because they had to travel to all over Iraq to find them when, where they had returned. Some of them were also done by phone. And those are marked in the data. I just don't know how to pull it out. Did that kind of answer? Yeah. Yeah. OK. You want me to just take people? Yeah. Um, so the book that you're currently working on, um, The Role of Culture um, in the U.S. Military Wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so as you enter these spaces, you kind of uncover um, the cultural material um, and you're writing your book. How do you center the narratives of the people that you talk to and the narratives of the cultures that you're kind of going to at the center of your book, and how do you mitigate and situate your own role as a researcher coming from Western country, coming into the Middle East, um, and the badge that that carries, and you know, being a woman, being a Western woman. Um, just if you could elaborate and kind of talk about that a bit. Mm -hmm. So more than half my life, I've been an Arabic speaker, and I've lived in the Middle East for more than. 12 years, and in Syria, and in uh, Egypt, and in Jordan, and in uh, Palestine, and Israel, and uh, all around. I'm really comfortable having those conversations with Iraqis. I didn't do the majority of the research with the Iraqis, um, because I didn't want my identity to be a factor in how they talked. Mm -hmm. So I had an Iraqi student, and, a, and, a, and, a, and I hired an Iraqi that I knew to do, so, to do some of the interviews. but. I'm personally, I'm really comfortable talking um, to people in various languages. For me, the harder part was actually talking to people in the military, because that's a culture that I'm not familiar with. Mm -hmm. And it was a real, I, again, I'm going back to Deepak Chopra, it was a really growing experience for me, because as anthropologists, we were taught to have empathy. I mean, we sort of are required to have empathy with our subjects. I mean, that's part of what we do as anthropologists. You sort of try and understand them and explain the world through their eyes. And so to really kind of get inside the heads of, that's not the right way to say that, so I'm going to take that back, but to, to talk to US military who had been in Iraq and Afghanistan and who had been involved in, you know, who had undoubtedly killed people, although I never asked him that question and nobody ever said anything, but um, who had been part of a military occupation, my country's military occupation of another country, that required some serious growth on my part to really kind of understand their perspectives and be sensitive to what they were trying to tell me and to be able to listen and to not just, not just um, 
sort of be angry about what what they had done. And it really stretched me, and I'm and I'm trying to make that clear in my book, because they were put in really difficult positions, and that's why I call it sort of a conundrum. They were told to go, you know, invade and occupy this country, and it was all done for sort of freedom and to bring democracy there, and yet they did and saw things and saw the way the policies were implemented that were at odds with that, and yet they were the, they were the arm that had to do that, and they, they really struggle with these things and talk about them, and, and, and I would say, well, you know, like, you know, yeah. and they say, we have no choice. We, you know, we cannot say no. We are, this is our job, and we, we have no public, we have no personal opinion. I can have a personal opinion out of it. And so I'm really trying to kind of, they're a harder population for me to kind of get my head around. But one over here and then here. Go ahead. Thank you so much for this talk. It's, it's really fascinating that you were able to conduct uh, a research of this scale. I never came across sure. anything of this scale before. Yeah, so it's not just me. There's like, no, yeah. there's like a whole, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, probably yeah. you need a lot of resources, yeah. both yeah. local and um, international, to be able to do this. But uh, I have two questions. Huh? One is about the data. Do you have anything, um, do you know of anything about the um, households where half of the household is IDP and some members of the household is um, some members of the household uh, cross the borders. Because in the beginning you said mm -hmm. uh, IOM has a different method of uh, collecting this data. So yeah. it's not individual, but it's not household either. So uh, this is one thing. So how do we decide? How do we make that distinction? Mm -hmm. The other uh, question is about the research design. Um, do you think this kind of research design can be applied or can be reproduced uh, again in the same region but under different um, circumstances such as this is the displacement by ISIS but about the um, displaced by the government like mm -hmm. before the Iraqi invasion or before and currently in Turkey or in Syria like would it be possible to do that kind of research because because this is ISIS I'm thinking local authorities are uh, willing to help more and then you might find more resources on it, but then if it's yeah. government displaced, how do we um, approach that question? Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, no, those are good questions. Um, the households. So we did a roster of, of um, and we update the roster each, uh, each round. And so we asked people um, who constituted your household before, uh, in, you know, before 2014, who constitutes your household now. So there are people who are abroad. We've even followed people. I mean, people who are part of the survey are abroad. Like five of them, I think. Have, a couple of them have been resettled elsewhere. There's two in Germany. There's, yeah, I mean, it's, so we know the, how, the roster data. We know who was there before 2014 and then who was there, who, who went into in, uh, displacement. Our sir, the person we talk to to fill out the, the um, quant is always um, the head of household or whoever is home at the time when they show up, um, an adult. So it's not even the same person who's filling it out from round to round, which is interesting. Um, I don't know enough about quant stuff to know what that means, but um, that will certainly be part of the the. the some of the issues that will, will be addressed in this. Um, so yeah, people go all over the place. We haven't crunched the data. Um, and then there's a lot of people that move because they get married or they find a job. So there's, there's a lot of this kind of movement that we, we take as before 2014 and then we trace them as they go out. But we, we only follow one person from the household who reports on everybody else. So people could disappear or not have been reported before 2014 that we, we can't force people. I mean, yeah. So, um, about the research design. So this is an IOM-driven project. I don't think a non-UN-based body could do anything like this. I mean, they have access to Iraq in a way that other organizations don't have and will never have. But IOM has done studies very similar to this in post-disaster um, locations in Haiti after the earthquake and in the Philippines after the hurricane. Um, 
And the person who designed this worked on both of those. And so she brought with her, that's Lorenzo, who's the, the, whose name is on here as well. She's the one who brought kind of this way of surveying and, the, and using this kind of de, the, the displacement tracking matrix into all of this. Um, I think this is a deeply IOM embedded understanding because the families are all, they're, they're, they, it is known where families are. If you didn't know where families are, I think it would be really hard to do something like this. So, at least it would be really hard to take a representative sample. I think that's kind of. So it could be replicated about sort of this place before ISIS. Um, no, I mean, nobody was keeping track of people unless they registered with the Ministry of Migration and Displacement. And before 2003 seems to have been largely forgotten, except in terms of land and property claims. But in terms of um, where people, in terms of people's movement, that, I, yeah. I do think the government has to be fairly willing to let these sorts of things happen. But a lot of these um, areas are now controlled by the um, Hashid, the PMFs, the Popular Mobilization Forces, um, which are militias that are kind of government, I don't know, I don't think they're quite yet an official sort of government arm, but they're certainly popular forces that were mobilized to drive away um, ISIS. And IDPs are very, some are very thankful to them and, and happy to be living under them, and others of them are like, some of them have fled because of them. So this is not easy research for, to be done because of various, because of people's fears around what they say and how it gets, um, how they could potentially be overheard. They have come to trust our enumerators because they've known our enumerators now for two years. Um, and they have the same enumerators with a few exceptions that they've had since the beginning. And so they, there, there's, I think, we're getting really good responses now, really kind of honest responses now, because they know they can trust our, our enumerators. But otherwise, I think people are very wary of, I mean, we ask some really difficult questions. And so, um, yeah. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to say only IOM can do this, but there needs to be an infrastructure that kind of captures all of this. And governments, as you say, don't necessarily, if they've displaced people, they don't necessarily want to let in an infrastructure that kind of can count everybody. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know your name, and then Alex. Um, also Alex. Oh, works uh, well. double uh, Alex. <laughs> Alex Ayn. Uh, so I guess my question for you um, is, you said when you met with these people in this, when you met with the enumerators in Erbil, there were some interesting questions that you couldn't, you know, include. So I guess what are these questions that were too interesting to ask and what are your observations from the study that you find interesting that IOM might not find interesting and like what, you know, what's your take? So when I've done this talk before, I've like, I've taken off my glasses and I've stood over there and I've been the anthropologist in the room kind of commenting on it and then I put my glasses back on and then I talk more about this. Um, but we're recording this one, so I didn't, I didn't uh, let myself feel uh, quite so free. Um, let me find uh, this one. So in coming up with the qualitative question, some of them really wanted to ask about, like, much more emotional things. So there's a really lovely um, person from Baghdad He's a lawyer by training, but he's really involved in like peace and reconciliation uh, activities. And he's one of our enumerators, just the most charming and delightful person. And he wanted to ask this question about, you know, how do you feel about, um, you know, what this means to you as a person and your personal growth? And we tried that to be inclusive. We tried that with our in our sample, and you know, you've got these kind of farmers coming from, from um, you know, you've got like a 75-year-old head of household man who's a farmer coming from, we, we interviewed a lot of Yazidi families in Erbil to start with, and he's coming from, from, you know, a village of 500 people, and, you know, half his family has been kidnapped by ISIS and stuff. And so to ask a question like, how do you feel this, 
has you know affected your personal growth and who do you are as a person wasn't I mean people were like I can't ask that question I mean there was a, there was a lot of discussion among the enumerators about what was possible to ask and what they were comfortable with asking and what they weren't almost none of them had done this stuff before and they were really nervous it was I I I love working with um, students and teaching and I really felt like they were sort of students um, and they were really nervous and I was like you got this you can do this just you know to try and stuff and they were like I don't know you know and then and I had to do everything in English and Arabic, English and Arabic, because, you know, they were. Now all the Kurds know Arabic because they um, can. They had to interview all these people in Arabic and, you know, and record everything. And everybody knows English well enough that they all talk to me in English and they like chat with me in Facebook on English and stuff like that. So it's been this really growing experience for them. And I think they also kind of wanted to reflect some of that in their questions, but it wasn't going to work. It didn't. I mean, it was those kinds of questions. There were also questions about, um, we had to strike some of, the, some of the health questions that the enumerators were like, I'm not asking that question, about like family planning. They were like, nope, not asking family planning questions. Um, and um, yeah, uh, you had another one. What was the other question? Sorry, I missed. Oh. No, no, no. This is this one is a is one of our problems. I said I would come back to it, and then I didn't. Um, we we've got answers for be before displacement. What was your primary source of d income in 2016? What was your primary source of income? Which is none, right? Like the big one is no source of revenue right here, right? Except that if you look over here, more than 20 percent of them are are working. So. <laughs> Like, we were like, what happened here? Um, and 2017, we got it, we got the question better and right and whatever. And I was like, what happened here? What happened here? We translated income as dakhal, which is kind of an obvious thing to translate income as dakhal. It literally means income, right? It's been what's coming in. But in Iraq, and the, I, and the enumerators told us this, and um, yeah, the, the, the translation, translation part was done um, a little bit in, in a less than ideal way. Um, dakhal means like regular source that's coming from a, it's like a salary. Dakhal means salary. It doesn't mean income. So people weren't getting salaries. So there's that part of it. So we just totally messed this up. I mean, we can't even use this data from 2016. I mean, I put it in here, but I noticed, noticed I didn't talk about it. Um, and so that was like just, we just didn't get the translation right. And that was because they didn't run these questions enough times in Arabic to, to get it, to get the kinks worked out of things like that. That's one thing I would definitely recommend anyone do. Um, but the other thing is, it was probably also compromised by the fact that we just met these, the, the people we were interviewing were coming from IOM, which is an aid organization, right? And so we're kind of saying to people, what's your source of income? We normally give aid to everybody. What's your source of income? You know, and we're asking them, what's your salary, right? And so people are like, well, we don't have a salary, and you know, maybe you're going to give us something. Um, so. That has, I think all of that has been fixed by the second round because they, they know what we're giving them. We give them $8 a month. Um, and they know that what they say or doesn't say doesn't affect their $8 a month or anything else they give uh, or get from IOM. And I think they trust us because they, so, I mean, IOM knows this and IOM would say the same thing. Um, but yeah, that's just a small, we don't have too many of these. I think this is really one of the only really ones where we really just blundered a question. I think it is the only one. There are others that are kind of eh, but um, yeah. We asked over 100 quant questions, so we had a lot of room for, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Alex, yeah. Um, yes, so I guess, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, this 
let me echo people in saying that this sounds amazing and, and the 13 papers that your students mm. write, wrote sound like the tip of a, an amazing iceberg of research to be done with this material. My question is sort of related to the earlier question about um, this group of people that was displaced by ISIS. And so my question is, how was that determined? Like, how were these 4,000 households initially selected? And were they people that self-identified as ISIS being the cause, or was it just based on whether they were displaced in 2014, or, or what were the kind of criteria for selecting these initial households? Yeah. Um, it's funny that you, as a historian, ask me, the anthropologist, a question that I am not even sure how to answer. Uh, let me see if I can go to this chart. I had nothing to do with this, with the sampling. So IOM, let me go back to this one. IOM had this big thing, this big data generated. And they were trying to record people who had fled after, basically after January 1st, 2014, is what they put down as their moment. So if you had left your house after January 1st, 2014, you got recorded. Um, whether everybody fled because of ISIS, we weren't in a position to to know that, and I and I and IOM doesn't record that because they don't track they don't track a family by name. We the four thousand are the only ones that have a number that we actually track. Everybody else is just is just are just displaced people. When we um, when they chose the four thousand. When they chose the 4,000, you'll notice that there's only 3,854 who actually, actually, yeah, 52, who actually are in the survey. We discovered that some of them hadn't been displaced by ISIS, so I think they were eliminated. Um, and when we asked why people, when we asked people um, why they weren't returning, some of them said it was because um, they couldn't because of ISIS, and others said they couldn't return because of community tensions. And we have been trying to figure out what community tensions means. Um, is that a code for my son was in ISIS, he was killed, but the family had to flee because we are seen as being part of the destruction of our community and so we can't go back because something someone in our family did. Um, is community tensions mean that there's a place called Jurf al-Sakhr and um, it's been taken over by one of the PMFs, by one of the, um, whatever that stands for, the Hashid, uh, Popular Mobilization Fronts. And that village is being accused of being sympathetic to ISIS, although no one has ever really promoted, uh, no one has ever put forward any evidence that they have, um, as far as I can tell, um, supported ISIS. But in the meantime, People have come in and taken over their fish farming operations and their agricultural operations and are like benefiting from their land. So is that community tensions because the PMF won't let people go back? Um, it, it, it needs a, a, re, a real fine-grained analysis by people on the ground who can, and a huge team to study this sort of stuff. But in general, it's based, all of this is based on this IOM DT, D displacement tracking matrix, and what happened. So I was on the phone from 9 to 9.45 this morning while they talked about the um, weighting this sample, and they spent 45 minutes talking about does it represent this, that, or the other thing. Um, but yeah, they've figured out that this, this represents 180,000 displaced families in these four governorates. Um, so yeah, I mean the the stats people worked with the IOM data to make sure that it's random. Um, yeah. Thank you. I think we're out of time. Okay. Thank you. Very yeah. Much. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Oh.